Hi, I'm Rabbanit Dina Freundlich, um, and I'd love to take this opportunity to explore together the character of Arona Cohen. One thing in particular that has always troubled me and bothered me um, about sort of the the character of Arona Cohen um, is his role in Chaita Egel. Um, in particular from sort of two different angles. One is really just the question of how on earth could Aaron HaKohen do what he does at Chaita Egel? Bad enough that he, as the leader of the people at the time, doesn't protest, doesn't respond to their request of Kum Lanu Elohim, right? Get up and make for us a new God. Bad enough that he doesn't respond to that request by saying, no, this is a terrible idea. You already have a God. You know, bad enough that he doesn't say that. But he actually goes ahead and takes a leadership role in building this Egel. It is he who initiates the idea of saying, bring me all your gold and, and jewelry and, and, you know, and, and all the things that, the materials that I can use. And when in fact the people bring him all their gold and jewelry, it is he himself who takes it and forms it in, into the, into this, this Egel. It actually says in Pasuk Dalit of Perak Lamed Bet, Vayikach mi Adam, Aaron takes, you know, the gold and the jewelry from their hands, Vayatsar oto bachert, Vayaasehu Egel ma it is actually none other than Aaron himself who actually forms the Egel. Um, and again, it just boggles the mind how on earth could Aaron HaKohen go and do this? So that's question number one. Question number two is, given how absolutely awful his behavior during this whole episode appears to be, how on earth do we then understand why he seems to actually walk away unscathed? The Psukim do not record any punishment whatsoever for his role at Chaita Egel. And not only does there not appear to be any punishment, but he actually goes on to be none other than the Kohen Gadol, which is definitely one of the absolute most honored and respected roles in the entire nation. So how on earth can we make sense of this, of like, how how can it possibly be that not only does he not get punished, but actually goes on to be the Kohen Gadol? Fundamentally, I would say that there's two different approaches to trying to understand all of what's going on here with Aaron um, and, and Chaita Egel. The first one, um, which is um, famously, you know, made by Rashi, among others, is um, to basically try to mitigate um, all of Aaron's behavior at Chayte Egel and minimize any wrongdoing that he did there and basically say what he did really wasn't so bad. The way that Rashi does that famously is by basically consistently going through Pusik by Pusik each and every action that Aaron does and showing how really it wasn't that Aaron was actually trying to propel and push forward and facilitate, you know, worship of this idol. Rather, he was actually every step along the way trying to delay the worship of the idol. So that, for example, when it looks like this terrible thing that Aaron is doing and actually suggesting to the people, great idea, let's fashion an eagle, go bring all of your jewelry, actually, says Rashi, what Aaron was trying to do was delay them. How so? Because, um, it says Rashi, he basically figures, oh, the, you know, the wives and the children are not going to be so quick to give up their jewelry by me telling them, oh, go bring all the jewelry. For sure, this will delay them since it's not going to be so easy to get it all. Similarly, the Psukim describe how Aaron himself um, builds this altar, right? It says in Pasuk Hay of Paraklamid Bet, Vayar Aaron, Vayiven Mizbeach Lefanav. It sounds like Aaron himself is so excited to worship this Egel that he himself builds builds the altar. It says Rashi, ah, it's not, God forbid, that Aaron is so excited to participate in idol worship. Rather, by him building it himself, he figures this will delay them. Because again, if I suggest to them to do it, and therefore you've got a whole nation of people working on it, it'll be done in two seconds. If I do it myself, it'll take much longer simply because I'm one person as opposed to many. And I can make sure that I drag my feet, I take a long time, I do it slowly, etc., etc. And therefore, again, Rashi consistently, um, every step along the way, shows how really what's motivating Aaron is not as what first appears in the Pesukim, that he actually is, you know, jumping right along um, to participate and actually even uh, facilitating worship of, of the Egel. Rather, quite the opposite, he's actually trying to delay them. 
And not only that, but Rashi also brings down the famous Midrash um, about what happened to Hur, which is actually um, sort of very clever that it's actually sort of um, mixing together two, two things and sort of killing two birds with one stone, so to speak, um, where the Midrash is actually picking up on two different problems. One is that when Moshe goes up on Har Sinai, he says, Hine Aaron Vichor, right? Here are Aaron and Hur will be your leaders in my absence. And yet there's this glaring gap in the text because we never hear from Hor again. And therefore the Midrash picks up on that and says, you know what happened? What happened was that Hor actually did explicitly protest when the people wanted to build some type of an idol or when they said this Kumase Lan him get up and make for us a god. And therefore the people killed him. And therefore, Aaron was not actually, you know, just being a weak leader or, you know, going along with what the people want when he helps build the Agel. Rather, he was being smart. He sees that if I protest, it's not going to go well, not just for me myself that, you know, God forbid he would end up dead, but even with putting the people first and having their best interests in mind, he realizes that if he simply, you know, explicitly says, no, I think this is a bad idea, they're just not going to listen to him and in fact might even kill him and therefore in addition to idol worship will also have blood on their hands and murder on their hands and that therefore again the midrash is sort of hitting as i said these two birds with one stone both solves this gap in the text of where's whore and answers the question of how on earth can Aaron do this by sort of putting them together and saying ah whore actually did openly protest they killed him Aaron saw that learned from that that's not the way to go about this if i in fact want to stop the people from doing this i need to do it in in a smarter wiser sort of um you know w- working in a clever kind of a way, so to speak, um, and and thereby sort of, again, goes through the episode explaining how all of what Aaron does really is basically all delay tactics. Um, and so that's basically approach number one, which again, both helps explain how could Aaron do what he does, and also helps explain how could he go on to be the coin Gadol, because it's basically saying what he did actually, though it appears terrible, is not actually nearly as bad as it seems. Um, Definitely, there's many um, strengths of this approach. Um, the the downside, I, I think, that always kind of bothered me is, again, as a shot reader of the text, it just, I don't know, really? Like, are we really going to say that, um, that, that, that what he did? Listen, if we're going to say it's not as bad as it looks, it wasn't actually idol worship, okay, fine, no problem. But still, to say he gets no punishment at all, goes on to be the Kohen Gadol, you know, just because we're sort of mitigating it by saying that he was just trying to do delay tactics. I have to admit, I always found this a little bit um, unsatisfying, though, again, it definitely has strengths, um, and I definitely, you know, uh, appreciate where it's coming from. There is a second approach, um, and the second approach actually builds off of a different uh, machloket that exists among the commentators, which is a machloket about what is what is actually the nature of the Mishkan. On the one hand, um, stands the approach of the Ramban. The Ramban really develops this beautiful, beautiful approach to the Mishkan as actually being this climax. Really, all of Yitziat Mitzrayim and Matan Torah is actually all building up to the Mishkan, says the Ramban. The Mishkan is actually what the real end goal is. Why? Because, says the Ramban, even Matan Torah is really just a one-time event, this grand, you know, thunder and lightning show when God appears to the the people, but again, in a one-time singular event. The Mishkan is even better than that, says the Ramban. Why? Because the Mishkan is a 24-7 ongoing experience of having God in our midst all the time. And therefore, he says, that's really what everything is building up to. And that happens to be one very um, beautiful and compelling approach to the Mishkan. There is, though, a second approach, which is the approach um, of Rashi and uh, even more so, I would say, of the Sparno actually even says it more explicitly, where they actually say the Mishkan is not actually this awesome, incredible lichat that is all of what we're building up to. Really, says Rashi, and as I said, particularly the Sparno, really in its essence, the Mishkan is actually a response to Cheta Egel. And the Mishkan was really God giving the nation an opportunity, a much needed opportunity, to basically achieve forgiveness and kapar for Cheta Egel. That there was nothing else that could possibly be big enough, so to speak, to get kapara to get a atonement for all of what they did in that terrible episode other than building this Mishkan, which gave them the opportunity for Karbanot, for rebuilding the relationship with God, 
again, then this Mishkan. Um, and again, there really are many compelling um, aspects to this approach as well. For example, the very fact that what did the people do in order to serve the Egel? They took all of their gold and their jewelry and they dedicated it to building this, you know, the, this Egel. What do they do in the Mishkan? The exact same thing of taking all their gold and their jewelry, but this time they're giving it all and dedicating it to God, to building a house for God. Um, and these types of parallels show themselves throughout the Mishkan, how in many ways it really does in fact seem to be God handing the people um, a, a gift actually, namely an opportunity for them to have some way of making up for what they did at the Egel and basically doing tshuva and, and achieving kapara for what they did at Chayte Egel. If we take that second approach to the Mishkan and we understand that one of the primary functions of the Mishkan was to enable the people to achieve kapara, to achieve atonement for what they did at the sin of the golden calf, then all of a sudden, it like turns our question on its head. What I mean by that is, we started out by asking, how on earth can God allow Aaron, after what he does at Chaita Egel, to go on to be the Kohen Gadol? But if we take this second approach to, to the Mishkan and we understand that one of the primary functions of the Mishkan was to achieve a, atonement for the sin of the golden calf, then all of a sudden it actually makes all the sense in the world that it in fact has to be Aaron HaKohen who serves as the Kohen Gadol. Why? Because if, again, if the entire purpose of the Mishkan is to get atonement, then he as the leader of the movement of Chayte Egel, he is the one who suggests bring your, all your gold and your jewelry, and he as the one who forms the Egel out of that gold and jewelry, then there is no way for him to achieve the atonement that he needs other than for him to be the leader of the Mishkan. If he were simply another, you know, regular Israelite coming and, and you know, just coming to serve God in the Mishkan and bring some karbanot, there's no way that anything less than being the Kohen Gadol could actually bring him and give him the opportunity for Kapara. He needs to be the Kohen Gadol because again, since he was the leader of Chayte Egel, he needs to be the leader of the, the Tshuva movement, so to speak, in the Mishkan in order for him to get the, the, the Kapara that he himself needs. Um, and so that's one aspect. And actually also taking the same idea, but even taking it from a, a second perspective, is to also say that the reason that Aaron is actually the perfect coin Gadol, precisely because of the role that he played in Chayta Egel, is that if essentially, again, if we view the Mishkan's goal as, as enabling the people to achieve a, a Kapara and Atonement for Chayta Egel, then really... Say, for example, if we had wanted to put Moshe Rabbeinu as, say, the Kohen Gadol, let's say that had been, you know, part of the plan initially, I'm not sure that, that Moshe could have played that role. Why? Because in order to be able to play the role as being the conduit, the messenger between God and the nation here, I think it really needs to be somebody who feels in his deepest gut the absolute desperate need for begging and pleading God for forgiveness. And I think that only Aaron, who himself played a role in the sin, and who himself feels in the deepest, most innermost sense, you know, parts of his soul, that desperate need to beg and plead, God, please, Hashem, please forgive me. I, I didn't mean it. I really want to serve you. I really mean that wholeheartedly. I think that it could actually only be Aaron HaKohen, who himself had, had played a role in Chayte Egel. I think it is only he who could really serve that role as being the messenger, as being the leader, as being the conduit between God and the nation, because only he, more than, say, for example, Moshe, only he really feels that, that, that deep desperation in, in his own personal inner gut. And I think that Am Yisrael needed that, needed their Kohen Gadol to be somebody who could really... Um, you know, come before God and approach God and beg for forgiveness, somebody who he himself, like, feels it himself in, in the deeper, most inner recesses of his own soul. 
Um, and so taken from that perspective, again, not only can we explain and justify how God could let Aaron be Kohen Gadol, but why it actually had to be Aaron who was Kohen Gadol and why he was actually the most suited and the perfect candidate for that job, both because of the fact that he, him, he himself actually needs that job in order to get his own personal atonement for the leadership role that he played in Chet Egel, and because I think only he could could really appropriately represent Am Yisrael and really beg and plead um, for for forgiveness in a way that, again, only he, as somebody who actually participated in the sin, really could do. Um, to take all of this and, and bring it to sort of a message that, at least for me, I know is something um, that's meaningful to me, is that I think that one of the lessons that comes out from all of what we've just talked about, and I guess I would say that comes out from Aaron in general, is I think sort of this lesson that our greatest strengths can be our greatest weaknesses, but also we can use our greatest weaknesses and transform them into our greatest strengths. And what I mean by that is, is that on the one hand, Aaron Hakohen's greatest strength, it really seems, is the fact that as Chazal characterized him, he is the quintessential Ohev Shalom Verodev Shalom. He just wants peace between everyone, right? Like even the first way that we meet him is when none, no less than God himself attests to the fact that even though his younger brother is about to, you know, overshadow him and become the leader, and he, even though he's the older brother, is merely going to be the sidekick, God himself says, He's going to see you, Moshe, and he's going to be genuinely happy for you in his heart. Meaning, Aaron is somebody who has no ego. He is total humility. He's totally happy for other people without any sense of jealousy or anything like that and it is precisely because of his lack of ego and his utter genuine happiness for others that he is able again to be this Oh, Hev Shalom, Vero Dev Shalom, which I think makes him perfectly suitable for the role of Kohen Gadol, again, who needs to serve as the conduit, the ultimate peacemaker, right, between man and God and between the nation and, and, and God. But on the other hand, interestingly, though again, it's this tremendous strength to be this peacemaker, this Oh, Hev Shalom, Vero Dev Shalom. But ironically, it actually does not serve him well when he is actually placed in the number one leadership role, right? Like the person who is leading Am Yisrael needs to sometimes be able to say, actually, I think what you're doing is wrong. I think you're going in the wrong direction. And Aaron, as the quintessential Ohev Shalom Verodev Shalom, the person who runs away from opposition because he just wants everybody to be happy. He just wants everybody to be at peace with each other. He avoids confrontation. And I think that it is precisely because because of the fact that he is this Ohev Shalom, the Rodev Shalom, which in general is probably his greatest strength as a human being, right? Like, who could not love Aaron O'Cohen, right? Like, wouldn't you want to be friends with him? Um, and yet, it, 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 when he is placed into certain roles, like, again, for example, being the number one leader, it actually doesn't serve him well because he's not able to actually confront the people in an oppositional way, even though sometimes that is actually called for. Um, and again, I would interestingly say it could be that he knows that about himself, which might be partially why he is able to be for Ahav Libo, genuinely happy for Moshe, because he knows that it's actually not a great role for him himself. Um, and so again, his greatest strength of being this Ohev Shalom, the Rodev Shalom, of not being oppositional, in some instances, like at Chet Egel, actually becomes a weakness. But flipping it around and looking at it from the opposite, right, the fact that he then sort of has this moment of, uh, again, I guess we could say of weakness, um, though again, you know, we do have to be careful in, in criticizing the Avo, but I do think that, that we can, and I think we can learn a lot from it. If we look at, again, at that moment of Chet Egel as, as, as actually one of the, the, the low points, so to speak, of, of Aaron's life uh, and career, if we take the second approach that we developed, then what I actually find very personally meaningful is that to me it gives the message of, you know what, even when at life we hit moments when we really mess up and really mess up badly, like not just in small little ways, but actually like Aaron O'Coin leads the nation to do idol worship. And yet, again, if we take that second approach, he manages to take what is perhaps, you know, the, the worst mistake that, that, that he could make, um, again, in, in, in facilitating the nation's worship of an idol, 
and yet is able to take that and rise from that and use that mistake to propel him forward to make him the best possible person to serve as Kohen Gadol because of his ability, therefore, to understand, again, in the depths of his being, the need um, to beg and plead God um, for forgiveness. And again, in that role, he is actually perfectly suited for it, Dafka, because of his Ohev Shalom, the Rodev Shalom character trait, which again is the leader did not actually serve him in good stead because the leader needs to be able to be oppositional and, and, and to say sometimes to the people, no, what you're doing is wrong and needs to be able to confront the people. But in the role of Kohen Gadol, it is actually, there could be no trait that makes somebody more perfect for the Kohen Gadol than being an Ohev Shalom, the Rodev Shalom, since that is literally the absolute, like, you know, essence of what the Kohen Gadol is supposed to be doing is achieving peace and helping bring reconciliation between Am Yisrael and God. Um, and therefore, uh, to me, one of the central lessons that I take from Aaron um, is, I guess, actually a few things. One is the important lesson of looking within ourselves and trying to be honest with ourselves about what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses and how can I put myself into roles where my strengths will play out as strengths and not put myself into roles where my strengths will actually not show themselves as strengths but actually might 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 play out as weaknesses. Um, that's one message. And then the second one is, as I was saying before, that if we do, though, ever find ourselves in life in a place where we actually really have made some some serious mistakes, then we can learn from Aaron HaKohen that we need to acknowledge it and not just whitewash it and not pretend it didn't happen, but try to learn from Aaron HaKohen how to take those mistakes and learn from them and utilize them to actually propel us forward and specifically like take those those moments of, of of mistakes but actually use them to propel us forward again i think it was precisely because of his own chayte egel that he was able to perfectly serve as the conduit for begging and pleading for forgiveness from god um, in his role as kohen gadol at the mishkan um and therefore again hopefully we can also learn from him how to try to you know, look look at ourselves well and hard in the mirror when we do make mistakes, but then try to figure out how can I use that mistake, not even just to learn from it, but to actually use it to in some way um, propel me forward. Um, okay, thank you for listening and thank you for, for learning with me.